Praise the Lord. Psalm 137. Psalm 137. It, I want to remind us tonight also as we're heading home, be very cautious of the pedestrians out tonight. Um, there's been many times, and it's been both vice, you know, back and forth, but Connie and myself, we say, hey, wait, what's that person? Or, you know, and, hey, look out over here. And all of a sudden, I was like, man, I'm glad you said that. You know, and uh, so be very, very cautious and uh, be, be, be patient. And, you know, we'll get home safely and such. But again, just beware tonight because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of energy out there tonight with the kids and things for, perhaps. And, and then keep an eye on your property and your animals and things. And good prayer night, huh? Good prayer visual night tonight. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Well, Lord, we thank you that we can be here this evening. We're grateful. We open up the Psalms and we just ask you to teach us. Holy Spirit, we know you're here. So teach us tonight as we go through Psalm 137, 38, and 139. So thank you, Lord, for your word. Bless it. Be glorified. Reveal yourself. And then let us apply these things to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 137. The writer here is longing for Zion. Longing for Zion during captivity in a foreign land. Probably, we don't know for sure, but uh, it, it uh, might be, uh, we don't know for sure who has written this psalm is what, I, what I'm trying to, trying to say. But in Psalm 137, verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon there we sat down. Babylon is not a friend of Israel. And so this it has been written during the captivity. And when we see Isaiah and Jeremiah and even Daniel, we recognize the captivity of Israel. But this is during the captivity. And so by the rivers of Babylon, our enemies, there we sat down. And so they were in captivity. Yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, Zion is just another name, if you will, for Jerusalem. And uh, so we don't have to get thrown uh, to, in a loop for that. I mean, they, they longed for Jerusalem. They longed for home. They, they were in captivity. And so, man, we sat down and we wept as we remembered Zion, as we remembered our hometown, Jerusalem. Yes, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. So they had given up the joyful songs and the melodies that were plucked out previously, singing about the glory of God and singing about God's city. They gave up on that. They hung their instruments. They said, that's it. How could we play uh, with the joy of, of the city of the Lord while we're in captivity. We can't. Verse 3 goes on, For there those who carried us away captive asked us for a song. Come on, play one of those joyous melodies we've heard about. When we were coming and encamping around Jerusalem and you didn't know we were in the weeds at the, at the dark of night getting ready to pounce on you, we heard these glorious melodies coming from within your walled city. Come, play us a song. You know, those were great songs. So they asked a song from us, and those who plundered us requested a myrrh, saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. They were joyful, and we enjoyed it. And yet the, the heavy heart of the captive, of the writer here is just expressing the heavy heart being in captivity. The reason they were in captivity is because they were not obeying the Lord. It wasn't just a random thing. The Lord had been crying out to his people saying, hey, come back to me. And yet God's people ignored that. And so now the captives want to hear that joyous, joyful melody and perhaps there might be some cynicism in this request. Hey, what's the problem? You know, play us a tune, man. You know, so it could go either way. Either, hey, we enjoyed that, or, or it might have been sarcasm on the captives, from the captives' point of view. Either way, it was very hurtful to those that were in captivity. How shall we sing the Lord's song 
in a foreign land. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. Now these are skilled musicians and skilled singers that, that the uh, psalmist is representing. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, let my tongue just cling to my mouth. I mean, this is terrible. I can, so we can feel and hear the heartbreak of the psalmist representing the nation of Israel in captivity, in Babylon, in a foreign land, in a place they have no idea where they're at technically. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. Now we remember that Edom, actually, es which is uh, represented Esau, Esau and Jacob were brothers. And we remember that. And Jacob had stolen the birthright of his older brother. We remember that in Genesis. And so Edom is, or Esau is represented by Edom, if you will. And then we remember that after the uh, angel of the Lord, Jesus himself, wrestled with Jacob throughout the night, Jesus changed Jacob's name to Israel. And so, but Edom, representing that hatred toward his brother Israel, when they were down and out, when, they, when the Babylonians were coming, then Edom said, hey, mow them down. I mean, in other words, let's kick, let's kick our brother while he's down. And that's where we get this. So remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. Edom wanted to see Israel completely exterminated. An amazing thing, Edom, Israel's brother. Yet, O daughter of Babylon, verse eight, who are to be destroyed? And so here's a prophecy from the psalmist. O daughter of ba Babylon, who are to be destroyed? Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Oh, your time is coming, O Babylon. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. God's vengeance will come. Pretty brutal way of ending the, the psalm. But truly, as we know, anybody that pokes Israel pokes God right in the eye. And God says, no, I'm not gonna put up with that. So that's exactly what's happening. Babylon was God's instrument of correction. But Babylon would, would be destroyed, as we know, by, this, by the Syrian, uh, the Medo-Persian, the Medo-Persian country of the Medes. So even though Babylon was God's instrument, Still, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Psalm 138, this now is a psalm of David. We've gotten that recognition. A psalm of David, verse one. I will praise you with my whole heart. Sounds like David, doesn't it? Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. This is David the man after God's own heart. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Now this is perhaps during the time that David's son Absalom had rebelled against his father and David was on the run. He wasn't gonna go toe to toe with his son. Absalom was rebelling and David said, I'm packing up and hitting the road. And David took his caravan. But yet he said, I will worship toward your holy temple for your loving kindness and truth. While David is on the run, he is praising the Lord. We need to kind of have that as a default position a lot better, a lot quicker. I mean, I know we eventually get there. 
but I'm hoping we can get there a little sooner. It'll probably save us a lot of heartache, a lot of headache. But David says, I will worship you even on the run. For you have magnified your word above all your name. We remember in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, John tells us that the word was with God in the beginning, and the word was God, and eventually the word became flesh. John makes that very clear in John chapter 1. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul tells us after the word had become flesh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we see this. So hey, you have magnified your word even above your name. In other words, God the Holy Spirit is pointing to Jesus, say, hey, right there, he's the way. We remember in Matthew 17, the voice came from heaven, hey, this is my, my son in whom I'm well pleased. Oh, hear him. He's it, he's the messenger. Hebrews chapter one, in various times, the Lord spoke to us through his prophets, but in these days, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. We starting to get the pattern here? Your word is above even your name. But we get it, the triune God. I mean, there's nothing separated here. There's a unity here. The triune God and Jesus, he is the one that brought that message. And once again, hey, Philip, you've seen me, right? Well, of course. And you've seen the Father. What? Let me go think about that for a while. I've seen the Father? Well, that means you're God, Jesus. Ah, now you're getting it. And so, this, you know, so we're seeing this coming together, all these little pieces as we study Genesis to Revelation. It becomes more apparent to us. We become more confident in our walk. And the more confident we become in our walk, the easier our conversation is with people. We're not nervous. We're not searching for things. It becomes natural. It's a supernatural thing, like George says, in a very natural way. But, but we've got to spend time with the scripture. We've got to let it soak in, soak into our hearts, and then come out of our mouths. And so it's wonderful. So we put it in our brain as we're studying. We let it seep into our hearts, and then it comes out. That's the process from here to here to here to someone else. I mean, we're saved. We're born again. Great. But that's only the beginning. Hey friend, Jesus loves you, this I know. Well, how's that? Well, the Bible tells me so. <laughs> oh really? Show me, I'd be glad to. Amen? So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hey, you have magnified your word above all your name. It's all about Jesus. It always has been and always will. David continues in verse three, in the day when I cried out, you answered me. Isn't that nice? We can review and reflect and be reminded, man, Lord, I remember that time. I cried out and you revealed yourself to me in a mighty way. Man, that's comforting. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with the strength in my soul. You made me bold. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. Once again, and we've seen this several times, but we see the word capital L-O-R-D. That's as magnified as you can get, I mean, in, in our context, in our English language. When we see the word L-O-R-D, all capitalized, that is the highest. That is like, Lord, there's no one greater than you. 
So all the kings of the earth shall praise you when they come to their senses. Now, those that, that don't believe in the Lord that will be wiped out eventually. But David is just thinking of future praise and just enjoying that idea. When they hear the words of your mouth, the kings of the earth shall praise you. Man, what a glorious thought. What a great way to think. And one day as Jesus is reigning, we're going to be find ourselves exactly in that posture. There's not going to be any elections. There's not going to be any advertisements, which I'm absolutely sick of. There's not going to be any of this stuff. It's going to be Jesus reigning. And we are going to be rejoicing. And David's, David is inviting us, man, consider these things. Break out of your routine. Sure, it was a tough day today, but break out of it, man. Rejoice in the Lord. Take a breath. Breathe it in. And that's what our psalmist David is, is encouraging us tonight. Yes, they shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high... In other words, his majesty is magnificent. He is on high, yet he regards the lowly. See, we couldn't invent Jehovah God. We invent gods that demand. We invent gods that take. We invent gods that push down. We couldn't invent Jehovah God. It's impossible. But the, the magnificent capital L-O-R-D, he is high, but yet he regards you and I. And furthermore, he regarded you and I even when we were at our lowest point. When we were engaged in our lifestyle and we realized I've got nowhere to go, I've got to cry out to the Lord, we were pretty lowly at that time, weren't we? And yet the Lord came and said, I've heard your cry. We couldn't invent Jehovah God. We could, it's impossible. We invent gods that are very limited and very predictable. Our God is totally unpredictable because we can't handle this grace thing. Because grace is his undeserved merit and it never goes away. In fact, it just gets bigger and bigger. We can't invent God. It's impossible, absolutely impossible. The Almighty God regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. That's incredible. I mean, we're all about the proud. We're all about the winner, right? In our competitions, and you know, it's healthy, healthy competitions. You know, the Rams, uh, seven, and, seven and oh. You know, I mean, it's good stuff, right? <laughs> But we're all about you know, the top, the top dog. So again, we can't invent God. He's about the lowly. Those that are humbling themselves and say, Lord, touch me. The Lord says, great, I'll be glad to. Now that you've humbled yourself, I'll do that. But the proud, the lofty, oh, I'm far from them. Oh, they're self-sufficient, let them take care of themselves. That's not gonna do well after they take their last breath. So again, the Lord, the proud he knows from afar, but yet he regards the lowly. Absolutely fascinating. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, David continues, you will revive me, Lord. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. That confidence is, in the Lord. Oh, I'm going through a tough time right now. Oh, I would, I, I choose really, I'd rather not be in this position, but you know what, Lord? I know in the end, you will have your way and I will continue and be yours. I'm yours. You're my father. We, you know, we were just talking about that this afternoon. Our Abba, our father, our dad. He's our hero, quite literally. We can call the Lord our hero. He's going to come and rescue us. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. 
Oh, David knows that the Lord will not forsake the work of his hands, but he's just kind of reminding himself, kind of counseling himself during this tough time. He's really saying, oh, the Lord won't, won't forsake. He'll come through. And sometimes we need to counsel ourselves that way, or we need to hear that from a brother or a sister. Hey, man, God will come through. Don't sweat it. And sometimes we kind of go, man, thanks, I needed that. And so this, this uplifting encouragement is good. So do not forsake the works of your hands. And, and, and David's saying, really, I know you're not going to. I know you're not going to. Praise the Lord. Good stuff, good uplifting stuff. Psalm 139, this is for the chief musician. This psalm is for the chief musician. Once again, this is a psalm of David. Now, David starts with a reality check. He starts out with a reality check and he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. David starts out saying, Lord, you win. Verse one, you're it. You've searched me. You know what's in this. You know what's in this. You know what's in my head. You know what's in my heart. And so David just starts out with that reality check. You have searched me and you know me. You know me in my present condition. At this moment, Lord, you know me. That's a disarming place to be. And that's a good thing. That's where God wants us. He wants us disarmed. He doesn't want, want us putting up our dukes or anything. All right, Lord, like Jacob, come on, I'm going to wrestle you all night. You know, and Jesus is just holding Jacob on top of the head. Are you, are you about getting tired yet? No, not yet. I'm going to get you. Okay, just, you know, tell me when you're done. You know, like that little kid. You know, dad's just holding him on top of the head. Little kid's just wailing and kicking and crying and everything, trying to get his way. And you know me. Lord, you know my current condition. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought. My thoughts are far off. In other words, before I even come up with a thought, you already know what it is. And so again, David is starting with a reality check. You know me, man. You comprehend my path and my lying down. So when I'm, on, when I'm traveling, you know, and even when I'm resting, you know. You're acquainted with all my ways. Lord, I'm disarmed. I'm coming into your presence. You, you know, you're it. You're God. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. Once again, that thought hasn't even generated in the brain yet, but the Lord knows. So D David is giving all glory to the powerful God himself. You know everything altogether. You have hedged me behind and before. So you're behind me, you're in front of me, and laid, you've laid your hand upon me. I have to recall to myself and remind us because I know it's very relatable, but when I ran from, as I was running from the Lord for those 20 years, the Lord always, always, always had his hand on me. Even when I was doing that whole Jacob thing, trying to fight the angel of the Lord, his hand and his love were always upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. And that's the truth. Such knowledge is far too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain, attain it. And your thoughts of me, Lord, your mercy unto me, your grace that abounds. I mean, this is just too much. And you even know my deceitful heart, but yet you keep giving. I don't get, I mean, it's too wonderful for me. David is slowing down from his fast-paced day. I mean, it's, being the king of Israel is an action-packed position. Wouldn't you agree? 
But David is slowing down saying, wait a minute, I need to meditate on God. I'm running on empty right now. I need to reflect. And when we do that, we start realizing, Lord, this knowledge of your love toward me, it just overwhelms me. And that's the point. God wants to overwhelm us with his love, his goodness, his thoughts, his mercy, and his grace. It's all just laying there. We just need to go up and look at it and say, wow, can I have that? And the Lord says, yeah, and there's plenty more for where that came from. But again, we're going this way, we're going that way. We're zipping around. I mean, we have responsibilities, yes, but man, there are times we've got to slow down. We've got to slow down and consider who the Lord is once again. And we do. And so it's nice to be in great company with King David. Amen? Amen. Wonderful. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. Well, that makes sense. I mean, we don't have any problem with that. But then he goes on, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there also. We forget that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He is in heaven. We accept that as, as, as our Sunday school teachings come into our mind. But to consider that God, you're in hell also? Yeah, I'm everywhere, and hell's a place. And guess what? I'm there. I'm there. So where do I go? Do I go to heaven? Do I go to hell? Well, you're there. Verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Jonah comes to mind very quickly, doesn't it? Doesn't he? Jonah considered himself in Sheol, in hell, when he was in the belly of the fish. He thought, this is it. I'm done. But yet he cried out, Jonah explained in his, in his book, in his writings. I cried out to the Lord. And can you imagine being a fisherman out on the, out, out on the, uh, the river, out in the, out in the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and all of a sudden see this big fish kind of pop his head out and spit this guy out on the beach? That would be a trip, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd be taking a double take. Whoa, what was that? No, but no matter where I go, the, I go to heaven, I go to hell, I go to the bottom of the sea, you are there. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, if I turn all the lights out and I hide in the corner, God will never see me. No, oh, yeah, that, that's what I'll do. Even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Because he's God. He created everything. And so there's nothing that hinders him. I can't run from you, Lord. Of course, why would I want to? But when we're engaged in activities that we know are wrong, just like Adam, when we hear the voice of the Lord calling out to us and we're in sin, what do we do? We hot foot it and try to hide. And that's what David is saying here. David had issues. He was a man after God's own heart, but he had, he's a human being. So where am I going to go to hide from you? Even prior to anybody even being introduced to me yet, David goes on in verse 13, you're the one who formed my inward parts. Before anybody even knew I existed, you covered me in my mother's womb. Mom's little oven. <laughs> you knew me there. 
At the moment of conception, you knew me. David is, is saying. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. I know these things. Let me trust these things even more. Let me have them even closer. As the disciples cried out to Jesus, Jesus, yes, we have faith, but Jesus, increase our faith. We know we fall short, and we know that you will hear our cry. Increase our faith, Jesus. And that's what David is saying. Hey, hey, you've known me, and I know that deep down inside. I know that because you touched me at the moment, even prior to conception, if you will, but for us to understand, at the moment of conception, you touched me. And my soul knows that very well. Now, some people spend their whole life fighting that reality. And they die in their sin. And that's a shame. But David is saying, hey, I, I give up. Good. Giving up unto the Lord's a good thing. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and was skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Man, you knew me once again. Know where I can go. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Again, at the moment of conception, God knew because he's the one that gives life. As I was fooling around with the Lord, just kind of being hot and cold over at Calvary Chapel, Miraloma, which eventually became Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. But I was playing games with the Lord, and when Connie was pregnant, and then Bo was born, the minute my son was born, the Lord spoke to me, said, I'm the one that did that. When I saw that boy, he whispered right to my heart, I'm the one that did that. I just, I, had, I surrendered right there. I said, you win. And I began my, my process of slowly coming back to the Lord. But that rocked my world. When I saw that boy, the Lord told me, I'm the one that did that. I couldn't argue. I had nothing to say. And I was smart enough to keep my mouth shut. You knew me as you created me. Even on, in the condition of being unformed, you saw the finished work. And in your book, they, are, they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Fascinating how the book of Revelation says, names will be blotted out of the book of life. Here, it would seem to be saying that David is saying, oh, every name is written in the book of life. But eventually, when you keep rejecting and finally come to that place that you breathe your last and you haven't accepted Jesus as Savior, your name has been erased from the book of life. The Apostle Peter tells us that God desires that none should perish. That's his desire. When we speak to people about the Lord, we've got to come with that perspective. God doesn't want you to die in your sin. I mean, we don't open the conversation that way, and maybe in some cases we do. But, we, but once we begin to have a conversation with people in our lives, we've got to eventually bring them to the fact God doesn't want you dying in your sin. We got to make sure that they understand that. And that's what Peter is reminding us. Hey, God desires that none should perish. That's his desire. You have to work really hard to get your way into hell. You got to really work at it. It's not easy. But it can be done. <laughs> Pride has proven that millions of times, perhaps billions of times. 
How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. So David is just absolutely surrendered unto the Lord. If I should count your thoughts toward me, they would be more in number than the sand. As you went to the beach this summer and you grabbed a handful of sand and let it kind of fall out of your hand, you started thinking to yourself, I know you did, you said, man, that's a lot of thoughts. And that's just one handful. Just one handful. Try two handfuls. And then try a shovel full. And then a, a beach bucket full, right? It's just incredible. God's thoughts for you and I, they're of good. If I should count your thoughts toward me, they would be more than the number of the sand, the little granules of sand, incredible. When I awake, I am still with you. Man, David is just absolutely having a praise party. And the subject matter is God's goodness. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. Hey, depart from me, you bloodthirsty men. Depart from me, for they speak against you, Lord. They speak wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Don't we cringe nowadays when we hear someone using the Lord in, in various phrases that perhaps come to mind? I hope they don't, but, but we know what we're saying. I mean, we're in the world. We're not of the world. But man, we just kind of cringe and just kind of, ay, yow, you know, just kind of, mm, okay. You know, couldn't you have kind of said something a little different? But no, that person is like, hey, yeah, yeah. Rah, 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 rah. So man, they speak against you wickedly, Lord. They take your name in vain. We were there at one time, but now we praise the name of the Lord. And we want others to join us. Come join us, man. Do I not hate them, O oh Lord? Do not I hate them, those who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I mean, David is just passionate at, at this time. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Now, of course, we live in the New Testament times. Jesus told us to love our enemies. We don't act foolishly. We protect our families. We protect our homes. We protect ourselves. But we are to be reasonable, understanding that people that hate God, they're just, they're out of their minds. So we've got to be patient with them. We've got to be careful. Again, we don't be ridiculous. We don't put ourselves in harm's way. And again, that's individual. Each individual has a different calling from the Lord. But David, this Old Testament David, he's, he's just crying out, Lord, this is what I can do. I can just proclaim that I hate those that hate you. But we'll keep that in context tonight. And finally in verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. And then, after you purge me, lead me in the way everlasting. Praise the Lord. David is rejoicing in his relationship with the Lord just as we are tonight. Amen? I can ask the worship team to come join me. What a blessing. We've been really having a great time in the Psalms, and what a great, great book this has been. And we're coming to a close here. 150 Psalms, and then we'll move to the Proverbs, the book of wisdom. But this book of praise, praise songs, has just been a real joy to, to walk through and to ponder. And I trust that... We can continue every time we go through our devotions and we hit the book of Psalms that we can truly join with the psalmists across the board in praise and worship. Amen. Praise God. Join me by standing. And Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord God, that we can rejoice, of course, with you, Lord. But we also got the opportunity to rejoice with David. 
Rejoice with the other psalmists, Lord, that remain anonymous, but still godly men of your word. We thank you, Father God, that we can join together as a family and as we cry out, Abba, Father, we know our heart's cry is received by you, our Heavenly Father. We join together as a family and we sing Abba. Hi everybody, Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we wanna challenge you, why not share these videos. You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.